Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, my talk for tonight, replacing your testing framework with two functions, courtesy of this very uh, useful package called GoComp. Uh, if, if you know what the package does, you kind of know where this talk is going already. At. Okay, so uh, introduction about myself. I am a programmer at Tekwa, uh, mostly Java-related enterprise stuff, so not really related to Go. Um, my experience of Go comes primarily from side projects. And in my most recent side project, I came across this, or I started using this testing method and I really liked it. So I thought I would share it with y'all. Yep. Okay, so introduction. Um, the Go's te testing philosophy is it's just Go code. And this paragraph is from this uh, Go programming language book. And you can see that uh, people are, surprised when they initially learn how minimalist goals testing framework is. So they're used to, you know, X unit, uh, X unit style tests where you have set up, tear down, before test, after test, and then you uh, utility functions for comparing values as well as aborting a test with exceptions. So uh, although the tests are very concise, written in this way are very concise, but they seem to be written in almost like a, a domain specific language, uh, a foreign language. So in Go, tests are just ordinary Go code. So uh, this is example is for maybe testing math.apps, right? You pass in negative one, you get, oh, is it one? If it's not one, then you call t.rf, and then you write the function name, and then what you expected and what you actually got. And or maybe if you want to abort the test immediately, you call t.fatalf instead. So that's your entry point to tests. It's just rf and fatalf. Uh, but this doesn't really work if you have a very big struct. So you can see here, uh, let's say you want to do this all in standard library. You have a reflect.d equal because you don't want to compare struct fields one by one. So you do, if it's not equal, then after you print it using, you know, the standard libraries uh, percentage plus V. So that prints structs with the field names and you have a huge chunk like this. So uh, in the red circle, uh, the first red circle is the God, and then the second red circle is the one, and you can see that in the middle is like just a sea of text. You can't see really what's the difference. So people reach for assertion libraries like Stretcher testifies, and you've got this very nice concise language where you've got assert.equal, you pass into testing.t, and then you have the God and one, and you get a very nice diff out of that. So you can see here, expected, what you expected, what the actual stuff that you got. Yeah. Uh, but at the cost of a huge API complexity. So just uh, testify alone, um, it, has, it actually has two packages. It has assert and require, and they are mirror images of each other where assert would uh, mark your test as failed, but not fail immediately, whereas require will fail the test immediately. And each of them have like one for one functions, just like that. Some of these functions seem very suspect, like you've got an assert the file exists, some file.txt. So why not just use, you know, go open the file, then check if the error was OS to error not exist, and then close the file after that. Yeah. So testify isn't the only assertion library out there. There's actually this uh, more lightweight alternative by uh, Matt Ryer. This package is called is. And uh, this uh, second bullet point here tells you everything you need to know about it. Okay, so you've got just four functions in the entire thing. You've got is equal. Is true, is no error, and is fail. So, uh, yeah, it, it's self explanatory and that's pretty much what you need, actually, most of the time. And this is uh, the failures are very easy to read. It does this very cool thing where if you put a comment after your assertion, like this, uh, these four is equal, is true, is no error, um, it will actually go into your source code and then pull out the comment. Like it will, it will do some kind of a reflection or thing, something, then pull it out, highlight the comment for you, nicely to see. Right, very, very readable. But comparing large structs is still sucks, all right? So it only prints values with sprint F. It's not a pretty printer. And is.equal is arguably the only, the only one doing the real heavy lifting because is true is just, you know, if condition. Is, is no error is just if error not equals nil. And if fail, is fail is just t.fail or t.fail now. So um, what did I settle on? Um, now my testing framework is just two functions in a single file inside an internal package called testutil.go. So package testutil. Um, the first, I, I don't know if how, 
Yeah, I mean, okay, so the first function is diff, right? It's, it's basically checking if two things are equal and it will return a human readable diff string showing exactly what, it's, it's basically what testify does, okay? So um, you have a bunch of stuff, but the most important stuff is the diff over here. Uh, that's the, the main heavy lifting because I'm calling this uh, go com function com.diff and I get diff back. And if the diff is not empty, then I will return, I'll annotate this got and want because I, I need to know that uh, the first, the, the stuff with the minus in front is uh, what I got and the stuff with the plus in front is what I want. And colors is, it'll just print a stack trace of whatever colors was invoked. So if you, um, yeah, basically you can call, you can put colors wherever you want and it will show you the exactly how we caught the colors call from the top level testing function. So it looks something like this. Diff test util, and then after that, I, I got the diff. Then if the diff is not an empty string, then I just t dot error test util dot color. So that, that will show the stack trace and then the diff. And then you get this, uh, it's basically testify, right? You've got the got and want up there. So you can see uh, what I, I wanted was this, uh, this, this uh, description you can see there. It's actually a long string, but it actually can figure out like what, how exactly the two strings differ. So it's telling me that, okay, uh, I got a string that is lacking this fast pace there because it's a plus in front. So I actually want fast pace, but it's not there. And then it's also showing a slice. It can show the individual slice elements, what differs. So the first two items there, I wanted those, but they're not there. Whereas the next two items are Lucille D and Susan Davis. They're actually there, but they're not supposed to be there. Yeah. So um, pros is, it's very lightweight. Everywhere where I need the package, I just copy and paste it where I need it. So I don't import a third party assertion library. Um, those two functions really just do all the heavy lifting. Um, a little copying is better than a little dependency. So I can customize those functions to project specific needs. Um, the diff function actually takes in a bunch of options here where you can do a lot more cool stuff. Like for example, some you, you can actually compare uh, floats, floats float values, yeah. So sometimes you want to compare floats and they don't, you, you know floats are not exactly accurate, right? Sometimes as long as they're within a delta of each other, you want to consider them as equal. So this is what you can, you can pass in the option that lets you like determine the delta uh, between the floats. And then if there's, if it's under that, it's considered equal. So you can comp you can do that if you want, but I'm not doing it here because I never really had to compare floats before. And uh, oh, and you can use generics. So other mainstream packages like Testify or GoCom, they actually haven't switched to generics yet, although I believe they, uh, they want to switch to it. So you can see here, uh, yeah, diff, it, it, it takes in the, a generic argument where they must be the same argument uh, basically. So if they're not, then call at compile time, you, do, you can't compare a pointer with a struct uh, basically. So uh, why not just call com.diff directly? Um, this is where I feel like the authors of com the div kind of uh, made it a little bit hard to use it direct, uh, directly because it panics whenever you have an unexported field. And if you're writing any kind of library package, you will most likely have unexported fields in your type because you don't want to export them. You don't export everything. So uh, you're, you're expected to do this thing where you call comp allow unexported and then you pass in the list of everything that you want to compare, uh, that you want to allow the unexported fields in. And it's going to be like really complicated if you have nested types within your types. And then you have to remember to pass in everything, otherwise it's going to panic somewhere down the line. So too much typing. Uh, I, I default to the, the default where I use this com.exporter. It takes in a function and then it checks whether the type can be, uh, whether it allows unexported and I always return true. So everything is, uh, this is basically the same ref, uh, behavior as ref.d equals, right? It just compares everything unexported. If you need to change it, of course you can change it. Like if you need a specific thing that you want to change here, yep. Okay, so, oh, and the, another thing is this comes the equate empty, which is very useful. It compares nil slices and empty slices as the same, nil maps and empty maps as the same. So I know that this has tripped me up a lot of times. Uh, I only re re uh, recently discovered this option actually. I was actually manually instantiating all my nil maps into uh, empty maps so that my test won't fail. But actually I can just pass this in and then they are compared, uh, treated as the same. And of course, I also need to mark it as got and one because if actually doesn't uh, enforce any sort of opinion on you, what is on the left and what is on the right 
doesn't actually matter. They say like it's just X and Y. I think the the variables are just X and Y. So you don't actually know which is God and which is one. So you gotta put uh annotate it there so that you know what it is. Uh huh. Okay, so uh what's the use of colors? Uh it started from this tweet where I saw. Um unpopular Golang opinion, right? It's not important to have expressive test failure messages. Like it's just like you just need to know where the failure happened and then you gotta dive into the source anyway. You gotta figure out what's so if you spend so much time making like a very descriptive error message, then you're still often time wasted. Uh, but line numbers are great, but they get messed up by assertion helper functions. So if you use a custom assert helper function, t.error only reports the line where error was called, not where the assertion function was called. Okay, so you can move it up the stack so you can show where the assertion function was called, but then now you lose the line where t.error was actually called. So if your assertion function calls t.error multiple times, you don't know which error was the one that actually returned the error. So basically this thing here, where you can either decide whether you want the errors and here, here, or here, or you can show the errors here, here, or here, but you're not both, right? I mean, they, that's, a, that's a choice that they decided to make. So what Colors does is it prints the entire trace from the top level test function where it was called all the way down to where Colors was called. So if you have something like test helper, it calls test helper one, and test helper one calls test helper two, test helper two, I mean, don't do this, but yeah, test helper three calls this, and then it finally got test util dot errors got here. Okay, so that's what you get. You get 33, uh, like 33, 34, 35, 36, and then finally got here. So that's, uh, um, it, it allows me to no longer think, have to, you know, think of a meaningful error message for every single test comparison I write because I write a lot of test comparisons. So I can just infer it by looking at where the line occurred in the source file. So instead of now, instead of like, if there's an error, I don't say, oh, this function return an error followed by the error itself. Or I don't say uh, this function, the results are not the same or something. And then followed by the diff. I just directly call test you the callers error, test you the callers diff. And then I can just look at the, where in the source file it is, and then, oh, okay, I get all the context that I need. Um, so yeah, um, diff, and you, diff and callers have replaced my need for a third party assertion library. Um, that's just a Go playground, uh, yeah. Um, then Go Comp has zero dependencies, and it's almost as good as standard library. It's actually maintained by the Go team themselves. And there's an active proposal to add Go Comp to the standard library as testing.comp. Although currently, uh, I have to admit, the API is actually quite complicated. Uh, there's some people don't really like how complicated it is. They say they, it needs to be a bit simplified before it can be accepted into a standard library. Oh, it doesn't replace mocking libraries like testify mock or golang mock, but I haven't really found myself needing to auto-generate mocks. If I need to have some kind of test double, I'll manually write a struct that implements the interface, so like handwritten mocks. 